The world of Frozen as we know it is now over 10 years old, but the history of Arendelle and its people go back centuries, millennia even if you believe the old sagas that claim Arryn carved out the Arryn back in the Age of Heroes. But you're not here to learn about myths and legends, you've clicked this video to hear the tale of two sisters, Anna and Elsa, and how they changed the kingdom of Arendelle forever. But there's so much more to the story of Arendelle and its surrounding kingdoms than you might realize. So for the first timeline in forever, I plan to not only cover the events and histories found in the first two films, but I'll be diving into Frozen's extended universe of short films, official novels, licensed comics, and more to give you the most complete and reliable video timeline of the franchise ever produced. My goal is to create an accurate and user-friendly visual timeline which can be referenced just as easily by casual viewers as it could by the creative teams currently working on Frozen 3 and 4 and hopefully this will introduce you to a few new Frozen stories along the way. All books and comics featured will be linked in the description. Welcome to Geek Critique, my name is Dakota, and I'll be your forensic chronologist today as we sift through the annals of Arendellian history. This video is made in close partnership with the Arendell Archives, a collection of fans whose work on mapping and chronicling the lore of the Frozen franchise is unparalleled. I'll leave some links in the description to some of their resources, from maps and geography, to concept art, to even more timeline information than I can cover in one video. This is also the first collaboration between Modern Mouse and Geek Critique, which has been a long time coming. Be sure to subscribe to his channel, which you'll also find in the description below. But for now, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment your thoughts. And just so you know, this video is best paired with a nice hot chocolate, so cuddle close, scooch in, and get ready to dive deep into the unknown. Before we begin, we need to set some proper ground rules for our Frozen timeline. First, I need to clarify how Frozen canon works. According to writer and director Jennifer Lee, to her, only the films are hard canon, but she encourages other writers to explore and expand the world and story around them. The films may not always line up perfectly with the expanded universe works in comics or books, but so long as the future films don't cancel out any of these titles, they're still canon-friendly or lore-enhancing. There are dozens, likely hundreds of one-off children's books and comics, most of which I won't cover for various reasons, but most of them are considered canon among fans. I've also decided to ignore the Olaf Presents shorts, the At Home with Olaf series, and the All Is Found short story collection, for reasons ranging from it not working within canon to it making the video too messy. The titles I do include in this video are the works most often considered amongst fans as canon or lore-friendly, and are a bit more mature. With that out of the way, how will I choose a year for this series to occur? There are many ways to attempt to date the Frozen films for our timeline, like determining what year fits best with all the cultural references featured, namely books like The Little Mermaid or paintings like The Swing, but this will only get you so far. Narrowing it down, most fans generally agree this series occurs somewhere in the mid-1800s, but is there a way to pinpoint it even further? Yes, there's a map found in King Agnar's ship with the Roman numerals MDCCCXL, or 1840, which is the year the map was commissioned. It's my belief that before Agnar and Iduna went off on their voyage to find Atahalan, the king likely hired a local cartographer to create the most up-to-date and accurate map that they could, and thus this is the year our timeline revolves around, assuming Agnar and Iduna's ship went down at sea in 1840. There's also early concept art from Oaken's Shed with a number of stowed items dated to 1842, so the theory that the first Frozen film occurs in 1843 has significant merit. Now that you understand how this is all going to work, it's time we begin our journey in mapping out the history of Arendelle and the greater Frozen franchise. I want to get this right, and to do so, I'd like to introduce our esteemed guest and friend, Josh Taylorson, a royal historian of Arendelle who has first-hand experience with many of the events we plan to cover. Josh, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. With the Queen and her company being away helping the people of St. Curtius restore their island, I think some company is overdue. I've started talking to the pictures on the walls. Uh, hang in there, Josh. What first drew me to Arendelle and its history was the impressive lore and culture that's showcased in the films. What about you? What first drew me to Arendelle was I was born in it. Everyone I've ever loved is here within these walls. Right. Let's begin. During the 1790s, Arendelle went through a period of grand reinvention as a newly married King Runard began construction efforts on a new and updated Arendelle Castle. 
Around this time, Runard became increasingly concerned with strengthening Arendelle's borders, and ever more wary of the magic he perceived the Northolder people of wielding, so he began work on a dam in the nearby Enchanted Forest to restrict their resources. He asked the neighboring kingdoms to help fund the dam, and in December of 1796, the two Vesterland princesses, Inger and Sissel, visited Arendelle and met with Runard to discuss the project. They knew the dam would be catastrophic to the local ecosystem and opposed its production. Sissel would sadly be swallowed up by a flash flood during this trip to Arendelle, and Runard was eager to blame Inger as the one who pushed Sissel into it, knowing he would not have her support on funding the dam. Ah, Sissel and Inger. Such a tragic tale. You know, it was Queen Rita, Renard's wife, who secretly got Inger out of the country unharmed after she was wrongfully accused of her sister's death. I had heard that, but what ended up happening to Queen Rita, might I ask? Nobody knows for certain, but the story some theorize is that after Agnar was born in 1798 and the castle construction was completed in the early 1800s, Rita was so unhappy with her life by Renard's side that she left everything and asked the trolls to wipe away all of her memories. Man, it's one sad story after the next in Arendelle, but I guess for Queen Rita, that was her doing what she believed to be the next right thing. Yeah. Renard turned out to not be the great king that we all thought he was. Recently, a lot more of his bigotry has come to light, thanks to Queens Elsa and Anna. Let me warn you, our history gets quite a bit darker before it gets brighter. Most of the historical information about Runard, Rita, and the Vesterland sisters comes from the novel Polar Nights, Cast into Darkness. But now we move forward about a decade to April 1812, with the flashbacks first visualized in Frozen 2. After many years, the dam has now finished its construction, and King Runard, a 14-year-old Prince Agnar, and a retinue of Arendelle's royal guards visited the North Older people in the Enchanted Forest to inaugurate the dam with a peace treaty. I mean, that's the story we were led to believe all these years, but thanks to Elsa, we now know the reality is that Renard had no intentions of peace. He attacked the North Older leader, and a bloody battle ensued. King Runard lost his life, and the fighting enraged the spirits of nature. Prince Agnar was knocked out during all the commotion. A 12-year-old Northolder girl, Iduna, helped save the prince, and the two made it safely out of the enchanted forest with a small remnant of Arendellian soldiers and civilians. The spirits then vanished, and a powerful mist covered the forest, locking everyone out. Except for the Northoldra and the rest of Arendelle's guards who were trapped in the magical mist. Poor Lieutenant Matthias, all lost in the woods. He's a general now, did you know? We also know when this event takes place because Matthias and the North Older leader, Yelena, counted every day they were trapped in the Enchanted Forest. Thirty-four years. Five months. And twenty-three days. And if we subtract that from our proposed timeline placement of Frozen 2 in late September, early October of 1846, we find ourselves in April 1812. Now we transition into the novel Dangerous Secrets, the story of Iduna and Agnar, written by Mary Mancusi. The book spans the years between 1812 and 1840, but the majority of the work occurs prior to Elsa's birth and relates the close friendship and budding love between Prince Agnar and Iduna. After King Runard's death, Lord Peterson took the throne as regent until Agnar would come of age at 21. Peterson was the only one who knew Iduna was North Uldra, and he made her conceal it, even from the prince. But the two never forgot about the people trapped within the Enchanted Forest. Every six months, those two lovebirds would sneak out of the castle and see if the barrier of mist changed at all. But the mist never showed any signs of weakening. Some things never change. Even after they were king and queen, they would send a patrol to check on the forest every six months. It's sad, really. Iduna never got to see her home again. During their teenage years, Iduna learned to engineer windmills, and many of the windmills she designed for the people of Arendelle are still around and in use well after the events of Frozen 2. The two found a secret library in Arendelle's study, which likely existed long before Runard's castle reconstruction, where they learned about the trolls of the Valley of the Living Rock. That same secret library would be the one their daughters would come to find and utilize in the future. Before taking the throne, Agnar was pushed to marry for duty, and he came very close to courting the visiting princess, Runa of Vassar. Oh, yeah. That was a stressful time for the castle staff. Let me tell you, Kai, Gerda, myself, and others were seriously rooting for Aduna and Agnar. But there was a minute there where it seemed certain the prince would choose Princess Runa. What do you think changed Agnar's mind? 
I think the prince realized that his mother married for duty and how unhappy that made her. And so he decided to marry Iduna for love. It was a new precedent for Arendelle as Iduna wasn't from a noble family, but the people of Arendelle loved her. Dangerous Secrets, despite being a fantastic read I recommend to any fan, does include a fairly sizable timeline error in that it claims the Battle of the Dam occurred 26 years before Agnar and Iduna's ship went down at sea. This is incorrect, as it needs to be 28 years to work with Matthias' 34 year quote, because only 6 years elapse between when the ship capsizes and Frozen 2. Our parents' ship went down in the Southern Sea 6 years ago. Prince Agnar and Lady Iduna are married in the spring of 1819, and Agnar is coronated as King of Arendelle shortly thereafter. Almost three years later, on the winter solstice of 1821, Princess Elsa is born. This isn't super well known, but since you're trying to collect a full recounting of Arendelle's history, I'll let you in on a little secret. Some of the castle staff have stories about how shortly after the princess was unveiled to the people of Arendelle, her skin turned ice cold. The king and queen were so worried, but I guess in retrospect, it was just her ice powers manifesting at birth. We know that Elsa was born on the winter solstice, or December 21st, thanks to old tweets from Jennifer Lee that claim as much, and also that Anna was born on the summer solstice, June 21st, 1825, three years later. Five years later, on a night in the summer of 1830, King Agnar tells an eight-year-old Elsa and a five-year-old Anna about his experience in the Enchanted Forest, and of the mysterious person who saved him. In service to crown and country, Iduna kept her Natholdra upbringing a secret, even from the man she loved, for fear the people would riot if they found out. Iduna would then sing the girls a song about Atahalan, where the north wind meets the sea. That very same night, while playing in the ballroom and making a snowman who enjoys warm hugs, Elsa would accidentally strike Anna in the head with her ice magic. Yikes. Yeah, uh, us castle staff didn't learn any of this until many years later, and that night would be the start of a very drastic, very bleak period for the royal family and the kingdom as a whole. Agnar remembered the secret library which held the book Secrets of the Magic Makers with information on how to find the trolls. They race Anna off to meet with Grand Poppy, who removes all memory of Elsa's magic from Anna's mind. For years after this event, Anna would have nightmares of a great wolf stalking her through the snow. Nightmares that manifested from the missing memories of her time spent with Elsa and her magic. This will all make sense when she's older. Watching from the sidelines were a young ice harvester named Kristoff Bjorgman and his reindeer companion, Sven. The orphan Kristoff was thereafter raised by the trolls. Elsa would go the next 13 years trying to conceal, not feel, her magic. The kingdom was never really the same after that. The gates were shut. Trade between the neighboring kingdoms became difficult. Elsa became more and more secluded as her powers grew. I told you this story gets darker before the light shines through. And then, of course, Arendelle became very concerned when the king and queen left on a ship on some unknown quest. In the summer of 1840, King Agnar and Queen Iduna would make a last-ditch effort to find Atahalan and get answers that might help Elsa control her powers. Iduna is 40, and Agnar is 42 when their ship capsizes in a deadly storm. Before the ship went down, Iduna, realizing she would never get another opportunity, tells Agnar the full story of how she saved him in the Enchanted Forest, and why she kept the knowledge of her North Ultra Pass a secret from him all those years. He accepted her for who she was, and they embraced one last time before their lives were taken by the sea. Yeah, it's depressing, I know. It was Arendelle's darkest period as far as I'm concerned. The Kingdom of Arendelle would once again go without a monarch on the throne, until Elsa would come of age. Actually, Josh, who ended up becoming the regent in charge of the throne after the king's death? That's a really good question, Dakota, and as a royal historian, I'm embarrassed to say that those three years were a total blur for me. I'll have to go and find some old articles from the Village Crown, and I'll get back to you when I find out. That is embarrassing, Josh, but don't beat yourself up about it. That's simply a period of time Disney hasn't revealed to us yet. Let's move on to the main events outlined in the first Frozen film. Elsa's Coronation Day is held in July of 1843, and is the first time the gates of Arendelle are opened up to visitors from neighboring kingdoms. We were finally able to put those 8,000 salad plates to good use. 
Many dignitaries came to pay their respects to the new queen, including the Duke of Wesselton, Prince Hans of the Southern Isles, as well as Princess Rapunzel of Corona. Side note, whether you consider Tangled to be a canon entry in the Frozen series is entirely up to you, but attempting to place it on our Frozen timeline makes things very messy. The Kingdom of Corona is mentioned several times in Frozen Expanded Universe titles, but the debate about whether Tangled actually connects to Frozen or whether it's just a fun easter egg has gone on for years. This isn't a history of Corona though, it's the history of Arendelle. During the proceedings of Coronation Day, Anna met Hans and the two hit it off so well they were quickly finishing each other's sandwiches. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, but Elsa wasn't happy to hear the two were engaged to each other after only meeting that day. She quite literally lost her cool. Elsa had bottled up her ice powers for so long that when they finally burst free, she unwittingly set off an eternal winter across the kingdom. Our queen really... Uh... Let it go. It was the earliest snowfall on record in Arendelle. A real howler in July, yes? As she ran away from her newfound duties as queen, she set off for the North Mountain, where she created her ice palace along with the sentient snowman, Olaf. To save her kingdom and her sister, Anna went on a quest to find Elsa, which led her to wandering Oaken's trading post and sauna. Ooh -ooh. Hm? Big summer blowout! There she met the ice harvester Kristoff, his reindeer Sven, and she hired them to take her to the North Mountain. Along the way, they meet Olaf, a snowman who dreams of summer. I don't blame him. The hot and the cold are both so intense. Put them together, it just makes sense. The four of them journeyed to the North Mountain where Anna confronted Elsa about Arendelle's predicament. I get the feeling she didn't know that Arendelle was under all of that snow. Elsa lost control of her untapped power then, and accidentally shot Anna in the heart with her ice magic. Elsa created the behemoth Marshmallow to chase the party away, and Kristoff took Anna to the trolls to fix the frozen heart Elsa had placed on her. Meanwhile, Hans took a group of soldiers to Elsa's ice palace to apprehend the queen, and the Duke of Wesselton secretly sent two of his men to kill Elsa. Elsa survives the encounter, but is taken as prisoner to Arendelle. The trolls tell Anna that only an act of true love can thaw a frozen heart. So, Kristoff races Anna back to Arendelle to be with her betrothed Hans, who never truly loved her and was using her to gain a political foothold in Arendelle. I know we've begun to welcome back dignitaries from Weasel Town in recent years, but the Southern Isles? Dead to me, after what Hans did to the princess. He really did fool us all. He left her to die, but alas, there is no act of true love more powerful than the bond of two sisters. Elsa thawed Anna out and freed the kingdom from its eternal winter. She would then leave Marshmallow to guard her ice palace, would give Olaf his own flurry to keep him from melting, and would sever trade agreements between Arendelle and Wesselton. For a few years, anyway. This would be the start to a long and beautiful relationship between Anna and Kristoff. A short film that occurs chronologically parallel to Frozen, titled Once Upon a Snowman, should be watched after the first film so as not to break up the narrative. It explores Olaf's first day of consciousness and how his journey led him to Anna, Kristoff, and Sven. We learn why he yearns to experience summertime and how he remembers he enjoys warm hugs. Some five months later, in December of 1843, the short film Olaf's Frozen Adventure occurs. It's the first time the Yule Bell is rung for the people of Arendelle since 1829, and Queen Elsa and Princess Anna are excited to share the season's celebrations with the people now that the gates are open. Yeah, that was an awkward event. Anna and Elsa were so excited to share the holiday cheer, but after the bell rang, everyone went home to enjoy their own family traditions. The sisters, already depressed, realize they don't have any winter traditions of their own after their years of separation. Olaf and Sven plan to fix that by going door to door through the village and collecting as many winter traditions as they can fit onto Kristoff's sleigh. But then the traditions caught fire and fell off a cliff, and then they caught fire again. Olaf, dejected at the prospect of disappointing his friends, hides in the forest. Sven incites Elsa and Anna to mount a search party for him. Reindeers really are better than people. The sisters let Olaf know that throughout the years, he was actually their Christmas tradition, as Anna would share something Olaf related with Elsa each year. If you're wondering why Olaf doesn't have his flurry in this short, it's because they're entering winter, and he no longer needs it. Six months later, on June 21st, 1844, the short film Frozen Fever explores the events of Anna's 19th birthday. Elsa wants it to be perfect for her little sister, and has hidden a number of gifts throughout the castle and the neighboring village, all tied to string. The only issue is, Elsa's obviously very sick and getting sicker throughout the day as she pushes through her cold. Every time she sneezes, she conjures tiny little snowmen known as snowgies. 
The day almost ended in disaster, but luckily Princess Anna caught her sister before it was too late. With nowhere else to place all the many snogies, they shipped them off to live with Marshmallow in the Ice Palace. Frozen Fever also features a map with Roman numerals reading 1840, which highlights that there have been no recent maps commissioned for Arendelle and its neighboring kingdoms since Agnar's mission to the Dark Sea. At some point between the summers of 1844 and 1846, Elsa's powers grew strong enough where Olaf no longer needed a flurry to follow his every step, as Elsa provided him with a new permafrost which kept the snowmen from melting. And good riddance to that flurry. It left puddles and damp carpets everywhere Olaf went. Now we jump into the comics. I include them primarily because they were created in conjunction with the release of Frozen 2 and were reportedly written with some supervision from the creative team on the film. The Joe Caramagna graphic novels, of which there are four, are middle grade books. While there is some information that informs the greater timeline of events, it's worth noting that the four stories are less substantial reads. In The Hero Within, Anna and Kristoff help a young orphan girl named Hedda overcome her bullies, but must team up with Elsa and Olaf to hunt down Hedda when she goes missing in the Forbidden Land. This graphic novel occurs in the winter of 1846, and all titles from this point forward lead up to the events of Frozen 2. Breaking Boundaries introduces a new character, Mari, to the mix. Mari is the princess of the neighboring kingdom of Vesterland. In the book, Anna is struggling to find her purpose as a princess in Arendelle, and Mari helps her along the way, all while easing political tensions between kingdoms. This book occurs sometime early in the summer of 1846. True Treasure tells the story of Anna and Elsa discovering a set of hidden clues left by their mother, which they discover on the six-year anniversary of their parents' death. It leads the girls on a path where their collective memory of their mother allows them to bond and come together as sisters. It's my favorite of the four graphic novels, and is bettered by the fact that it confirms the parents died sometime midsummer, six years prior to the events of Frozen 2. Reunion Road sees the Frozen cast head on a perilous journey to the neighboring town of Snoob, which is where Kai, the steward of Arendelle Castle, comes from. Snoob is having an end of summer harvest festival, and it's apparently what gave the Arendellians the idea to throw their own harvest festival at the start of Frozen 2. All four of these graphic novels feature the new character Mari at least once per book, which is fine, except for the fact that she is featured in The Hero Within, which must take place before Breaking Boundaries, the book she is formally introduced in, because it's winter. We know the parents die in the summer, six years prior to Frozen 2, and Anna is coronated in the fall, so any winter in The Hero Within must be before the summer of 1846. So Mari's inclusion in Arendelle there is a bit of a plot hole, though she doesn't technically interact with Anna or Elsa. Princess Mari of Vesterland sometimes comes by Arendelle just to visit. It's quite possible she was simply taking a stroll through the town. It's also possible that these don't all occur in the year 1846, as there are certain anachronisms, like Kristoff's sleigh, which was destroyed in Olaf's frozen adventure, but we'll leave them as is for now. In early September of 1846, we dive into the events of the novel Forest of Shadows by Camilla Banco. A strange blight hits Arendelle where once strong animals began turning white and falling into a deep sleep, and crops were shriveling to ash. With the upcoming Harvest Festival right around the corner, Anna promised that the Queen would fix the blight in just a few days. A big promise, one Elsa wasn't sure she should have made. The blight was... a strange one. It was here one minute and gone the next. I don't really have strong memories of these events. That's very convenient, as very few people remember them. The blight got worse before it got better. Anna found the secret library their parents had used back in the day, but Elsa was worried the books would cause more trouble than they were worth. She was right. Anna recited a spell and unwittingly gave the blight a corporeal, real form, a form based on her age-old nightmare of a giant wolf. The creature was a not Mara, and wherever it went in Arendelle, it put people to sleep and took control of their bodies as they screamed in horror. In their escape from the giant wolf, who just so happened to grow bigger every time Elsa used magic, they passed through an ancient passage beneath the castle, where they found a viking ship likely over a thousand years old. Perhaps belonging to Aaron, the hero who first founded Arendelle. The party make their way to the scientist Sorensen in the mountains, who explains that only a thing of legend can defeat a beast of legend like the Natmara. Aaron's blade, Revolute, was a thing of legend, but it hadn't been seen in centuries. Without spoiling too much of the book, I'd like to say it's probably the most terrifying story in the Frozen canon, and could never be put in a movie and still retain a PG rating. Are you sure this happened? I don't remember any giant wolf stalking through Arendelle. Mm, I'm gonna have to ask the Queen about this one. 
The scientist Sorensen is also featured in other novels like Dangerous Secrets and Polar Nights, and he even gets a few mentions in the podcast adventure Forces of Nature. There is a timeline issue in this one where they claim their parents died seven years ago, despite Frozen 2 claiming only six had passed. The events of Frozen 2 occur in the tail end of September and early October 1846. The leaves are already falling, the Harvest Festival is about to begin, and Kristoff is finally prepared to propose to Anna, but the moment keeps slipping away from him. I'll never forget that festival. It began with the Queen promising all of Arendelle that their flag would always fly. And by the end of it, the flag literally flew away. After hearing a voice calling out to her throughout the festival, Elsa finally engaged with it, only to awaken the spirits of nature who forcibly remove everyone from Arendelle and set in motion a cascade of events that take the group to the Enchanted Forest. There they saw the mist that their parents had been barred from all those years ago, and yet, for some reason, it allowed them entry. Inside the mist, they find not only enraged spirits of air, fire, water, and earth, but the North Uldra people and the remnants of Arendelle's soldiers alive and well after over 34 years. After Olaf catches the two groups up to speed, the girls discover that it was their mother who had saved their father some 34 years ago, and that she was North Uldra. I wasn't around for most of this adventure, but this was an important turning point in Arendelle's history, as it cemented the bond between the two warring people. After soothing the spirits of the forest, Elsa and Anna continue following the voice inside Elsa's head all the way to the shipwreck of their parents' ship. Using Elsa's newfound ability to visualize the memory of water, they learn the truth of their parents' last few moments alive, and that they were searching for Otto Holland's secrets to help Elsa. This is where we find the map in their ship dated to 1840, and how we've unraveled the whole of Arendelle's history before and after the shipwreck. Elsa pushes Anna and Olaf away as she makes her way to Otto Holland with the eventual help of the Waternock, and it's there that we learn Elsa is the fifth spirit, a bridge between the spirits of nature and humanity. She also discovered there that her grandfather, King Runard, built the dam for the North Uldra to weaken their lands, and Elsa sends a message to Anna telling her as much. But in so doing, she dives too deep and lost herself, dying in Atahalan. As Elsa's magic fades, so too does Olaf. Oh, Anna. She was alone that day, and somehow she got up, took a step, and did the next right thing. Anna found a way to trick the rock giants into destroying the dam. Uh, which uh, was terrifying, by the way. That water nearly took out all of the Arenfjord. Breaking the dam broke the curse on the Enchanted Forest, and Atahalan resuscitated Elsa so that she could stop the waters from destroying Arendelle. The mist lifted for the first time in 34 years, and Elsa revived Olaf. Thank goodness water has memory. But wait, has anyone checked on Marshmallow and the Snow Geese? Did Elsa remember to bring them back? Don't worry, Josh. They're doing all right. Olaf checked in on them. After much trial and error, Kristoff finally asked Anna to marry him, which she enthusiastically said yes to. Queen Elsa would abdicate the throne of Arendelle in the third year of her reign as her role as the fifth spirit required her full attention. Anna, now 21 years of age, would assume the throne as Queen of Arendelle in the fall of 1846. She hasn't even been queen a year yet, and sure, she's a bit of a fixer-upper, but so far she's done a fantastic job, and Elsa still shows up for game nights. In December of 1846, two months after Anna's coronation, the events of the novel Polar Nights, Cast Into Darkness by Jen Kalanita and Mary Mancusi occur. In preparation of the Polar Nights festivities, Elsa's 25th birthday, and Anna and Kristoff's third annual chalkiversary, the friends all take a night out to go camping and tell scary stories. Kristoff's story about how Inger pushed Sissel into the river was especially scary, particularly because Sissel never got a proper burial, and that night was the 50th anniversary of Sissel's death. He claimed that now sinister Sissel haunted the world as a draugr. Oh, Kristoff. What did you do? Everyone knows, you don't tell a Draugr's story on the night they die. Sure enough, Sissel's reanimated corpse came and hunted them while they slept, but what it was searching for was a mystery. All it could mutter was the word, SISTER. To make matters worse, Sissel's presence caused those it came into contact with to forget, and Elsa's magic stopped working around her. Even Kristoff began forgetting his relationship to his fiancée, Anna. The sky became incredibly dark, darker than usual, and with pirates reportedly patrolling Arendelle's coast, this was a tense holiday season. And a forgetful one. The only reason I remember any of this event was because it was all documented in the Village Crown after the fact. 
Anna and Elsa head to Vesterland to meet with Princess Mari and King Jonas to learn more about the Vesterland sisters to fix the curse placed on the land from Sissel the Draugr. It turns out Sissel may not have been as sinister as we all thought. The most recent adventure occurring in the spring of 1847, Season 1 of Forces of Nature is the first audio adventure on our list. The island kingdom of Sankirtius had recently flooded, and Queen Anna opened the gates of Arendelle to Queen Disa and her people while they recovered. Meanwhile, the Duke of Wesselton's nephew, Wolfgang, was in Arendelle after a multi-year apology tour for his uncle's actions during Elsa's coronation. Wolfgang was sincere, sure, but he didn't have to apologize so often. He apologized three times to me alone. Strange mechanical automatons began popping up all over Arendelle and the Enchanted Forest, and their origin was unclear. Their presence caused the spirits of nature to become restless, and the kingdom was racked with bizarre and powerful storms. We might have gotten ahead of ourselves with uh, certain wrongful imprisonment, but it was all sorted out fairly quickly once we learned the truth. After the events of Forces of Nature Season 1, Queen Anna brought much of her retinue and royal guard to Sankirtius to help shore up the island kingdom's defenses to prevent future flooding. And they've been gone for a while now. The castle's been pretty quiet since they left for Sankirtius, but I'm so glad to have helped you in mapping out Arendelle's recent history. Thank you for having me. No, thank you for your help, Josh. With the confirmation of Frozen 3 and 4 being in active development, and the new Arendelle-themed land in Hong Kong Disneyland, I have a feeling there will be many more Frozen stories to come. Before you get going, I just want to say that my name's Josh Taylor from Modern Mouse. I'm so thankful for Dakota for asking me to be a part of this. And uh, if you want to check out anything that I do, I talk a lot about Disney movies and animation and analyze them, talk about the psychology or social situations going on around them. I talk a lot about the behind the scenes of those films. And in fact, right now I have a video up about Frozen that features Dakota in it. Um, so you could check that out after you finish watching this video. Um, but in the meantime, hey, Dakota, do you want to build a snowman? It doesn't have to be a snowman. Go away, Josh. Okay, bye. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more timeline based content. What do you think? Did we get this right? I hope we thrilled you in the way you deserve. For more info on the lore and history behind the Frozen franchise, find links to a number of resources from the incredible work of the Arendelle archives in the description, as well as a link to Modern Mouse's YouTube channel. Patreon members will find a link to download a massive PNG of our Frozen timeline graphic. Thanks guys, long live the timeline.